morning. Welcome everybody to um, probably the last of the um, online talks for the time being, because we hopefully will be going out into the field soon. But we will we will let you know um, if there are any other future online talks, and there will there will be some. Um, but we'll probably take a while now to sort ourselves out and go out into the field. Um, today we're very lucky to have um, Ian Fairchild doing a talk on aspects of geology of the Ice Age ponds in Herefordshire. And um, so that will take about, I think it's about half an hour to 35 minutes. Um, then we can have questions on that. And after that, we can have any questions on, um, well, on Ian's talk. And then any, after that, any questions generally about the project that you've got about surveying. And we'll have news on, um, from, uh, on what we're doing next, who are about to be sending out an email allocating ponds to, to people to survey. But anyway, um, so I shall now hand you over to Ian. If you could, um, once again, please mute your microphones and we'll have Ian uh, do his talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. So the pictures we've got here to start with, um, illustrate how profoundly the landscape um, would, have, would have changed over the last 20,000 years. So the very icy picture is um, modern Svalbard, um, but Herefordshire would, would have had a very significant ice cover with just some rocks sticking up as nunataks out of it um, just over 20,000 years ago. And of course now you just wouldn't know, would you? <laughs> We have this gentle rolling landscape uh, that we that we that we now see with these uh, ponds in it, and so we're going to explore um, what we can learn about uh, about this. We have we have, so although it's it's a fairly subdued landscape um, uh, and a kind of pastoral landscape, there's actually there is actually quite a lot of variety once you. Uh, you, you get into things. So the upper left, we've got a really nice um, example of, of a richly vegetated pond. Um, on the upper right, we've got this these remarkable uh, lowland area, the Lef Lefton Lowlands, where the Sturt's Nature Reserve is held. And this is actually effectively an extension of the Y floodplain. And we see it here as it was flooded in February last year. Um, it was also a lake during the Ice Age, and um, we see a lot of um, ponds on, on this landscape too, and uh, it'd be nice to know a little bit more about how, how those ponds originated. Um, down at the uh, bottom, we've got um, a nice rolling landscape, a hummocky landscape. This is near, near Lupton in the northeast of the, uh, of the county. And in the middle, we've got some sediment, we've got peat on the right, we've got a, a glacial deposit, a till in the middle, you can see some pebbles, angular pebbles in it. Uh, and on, on this, uh, here in the middle, we've got Elmley Dingle, and Elmley Dingle is a, is a valley that was eroded by the ice, by, by meltwater, probably underneath the ice. So a, a whole variety of different things um, went on. The most extensive glaciation um, in the British Isles um, happened, we believe, about 450,000 years ago. Certainly that was the, the, the date that East Anglia was covered in ice, and, and that's often equated with the most extensive glaciation further west. Um, and at that time, the whole of Herefordshire was covered by ice. So there are lots, lots of um, uh, deposits from that glaciation that are still around in, in Eastern Herefordshire, but they are mostly eroded now. And in Western Herefordshire, they are, um, they, they, a lot of them were eroded, and then those that were left are, are now covered up by the, by the younger deposits. So the younger deposits, the ones that we're particularly interested in, um, form from what we call the Devensian glaciation just over 20,000 years ago. And we see that this is basically ice from Wales um, spreading down into the lowlands and covering the western half um, of the county of Herefordshire here, shown in the map. So here's a schematic view of what, what was happening here. There was a, 
a lobe of ice coming down um, with um, higher ground in the hill, lines of hills to the north and to the south. And at the distal margin at the east here, um, vast amounts of meltwater would have flowed off the ice into the into the lug valley and the gravels that um, represent the deposits of those streams, uh, of course, underlie um, Hereford, an important source of water underneath Hereford. Um, the ice retreated. Um, perhaps um, it didn't take that long to retreat, but it got to a certain point when uh, we believe there was a, a, a lake here, and that was forming in these Letton lowlands that I just mentioned just now, with um, a hill to the east, um, which is the site of what's called the Staunton Moraine. In fact, that hill is mostly made of, of bedrock, but it has got a, a drape of um, glacial deposits on top, and it acted as a, as a barrier um, at that point, and allowing um, water to be impounded down there in, in the lake basin. So, um, and, and so just picking up on that theme then, that, that Staunton Moraine Ridge is this, um, is what we see in the, in the intermediate skyline here. We're looking from the east, you can see Hay Bluff in the background. Um, and, and that feature is, is, that, um, is that bedrock ridge with, with moraine draped over the, uh, glacial sediment draped over the top. Um, it's a much more subtle feature than, than the features you would see in upland glaciated landscapes. Um, and so it actually takes quite a bit of time to get your eye in and see what is there. And a product of this um, project will be a whole set, set of resources, um, uh, mainly on an app, but also will be available on a website, which actually try and deconstruct the landscape and show you uh, what features are to be found uh, where. Um, because even an experienced geologist wouldn't be able to look at a landscape like this and actually know what was going on. You've got to be able to see maps and um, aerial views as well. And then um, the lower view here is similar uh, in a way to the view that I showed you with the, the rainbow and the floods you know, um, just now, though it's taken from a different viewpoint. This particular picture is taken from the storms and rain, looking west down into the little lowlands where you've got the Sturts Nature Reserve down there. Um, and and that, that was where this, this lake existed during the partial retreat of the glacier. So let's look at one or two pictures of modern glacial environments to get our uh, eye into the kinds of features that would have been generated at the time the glacier was around. And the most um, excitement occurs just beyond the limit of the ice. So we've got a glacier here. This is in a deep valley in the Canadian Rockies. Saskatchewan glacier and we see the glacier there it's, it's actually been retreating for a while and these are the um, deposits here in the valley formed by rivers um, but glacial meltwater streams draining that glacier and that um, uh, those river deposits then are flanked by um, moraines which are mounds of glacial debris um, which uh, accumulated while the glacier was was there and these moraines are pretty chaotic in, in appearance. Um, and they're not only chaotic at, at any one time, they also evolve over time in that a lot of them will be underlain by ice. And over time, that ice will melt. And so often you find what are originally mounds end up as depressions. The topography can change quite a lot. Um, now, in some environments, like modern Iceland, um, melting of, of ice happens really quickly because the surface of the ground is often black because of the black volcanic ash. And in just a handful of years, you can get big um, kettle hole ponds formed by melting of ice. Um, on the other hand, we think that in Herefordshire, um, it was a situation that was at the other extreme. It may have taken many thousands of years for the landscape to evolve and for all the ice to disappear. And that's because it's very, uh, it seems um, that there was um, a, a zone of periglaciation, a zone where you had permafrost, permanently frozen ground near the surface for thousands of years. And over that surface, of course, you would have had the famous um, uh, megafauna, the mammoths and so on, wandering around um, in, in that kind of tundra landscape for thousands of years um, before the landscape eventually kind of settled down and all the ice had, had melted away. 
couple of other views. This one at the upper right is another modern glacier. This one's from Austria, again illustrating how messy and complicated these zones are that are uh, immediately in front of, of the ice. Um, and this again is going to be, you know, that's that's that you can see the modern glacier there is only just starting to evolve um, in terms of uh, how that how that landscape will change. Um, on the le upper left, we've got part of our Herefordshire area. This is the area um, near Shogden, and um, it's an image that's um, a hill shaded lidar image. So lidar is a um, a method of obtaining very accurate heights of the landscape by laser scanning from an aircraft and you, you just get a, a raw file of a matrix of heights of the land which can be rendered as this um, image here which makes it because of the sun is shining over the landscape and what it's showing us is a, is a landscape of, of what we call hummocky moraines quite a few ponds in here some of which go back to the ice age the area to the north is a bit smoother and that's um, largely because it's forested and you, and you don't get such a detail of the landscape there. But also this, this area in the north is, represents the northern flank of the glacier. So the glacier was moving from west to east, from left to right, um, and these hills on the uh, northern margin, uh, some, of, some of them may have indeed have stuck up above the ice. Now when looking at hummocky moraines, and, and people talk a lot about them in modern glacial environments, and one thing they say is, well, a lot of them form by the ice actually um, displacing, thrusting um, uh, as, it, as, it, uh, as, it, as it moves forward, perhaps seasonally and so on. But in that case, you'd expect a lot of the moraines to kind of line up. And it, there's actually no sign of that here. Another thing to bear in mind is that in, in, in this sort of chaotic terrains that we can see here, lots of different things can happen. You get a lot of small streams reworking sediment. You can have flowing material flowing down slopes. You have little deltas forming. Um, it can be really complicated and it's actually quite difficult to, um, to reconstruct exactly what happened in a landscape like this. So I must confess that I'm pretty baffled as to exactly how this landscape here evolved. It's very complicated and very locally variable. Um, but we do, uh, we have a, a geomorphologist from Keele coming to the rescue, Keele University, uh, Richard Waller, a former uh, colleague of mine, um, and he's, he's got um, a, a master student, Olivia, uh, and she's been supervised also by a geophysicist, and, and uh, they're going to be having a look at the landscape from the point of view of both geophysics, looking underneath some of the, some of the ponds and, and looking at the, the landforms to see if they can uh, find out a bit more about how they how they form. So Herefordshire has been pretty neglected by glacial geomorphologists um, over the years. There, there, there's, the literature is quite sparse um, and uh, so there's there is scope for, for, for more work. Now kettle holes then. So during the project we've had to sort of develop some criteria for how do we know something is an ice age pond. The most common ice age ponds are um, we believe kettle holes and kettle holes form by melting of underlying ice. So in order for that, uh, for us to identify a pond as a kettle hole pond, for a start it needs to form a closed depression in the landscape. So ideally you don't want to have a stream draining out of it. Although sometimes of course um, uh, farmers have cut uh, drainage channels away from ponds. So uh, we have to bear in mind that there may be a lot of um, alteration by agricultural activity. But we're looking for closed depressions in the landscape. Now, closed depressions are not normal in landscapes. You get them in karstic landscapes on limestone, where, where the water disappears on the ground. But uh, away from those environments, you wouldn't normally expect depressions to be closed. They, they should be part of a uh, fluvial drainage, river drainage system. So that's one thing that's distinctive then, closed depression. And the second one is that there should be glacial sediments uh, underneath the um, the ponds and, and surrounding them. Um, but that to get proof though, you'd actually have to get a, do a geophysical survey or core underneath the pond to, to see that it had a, a thick layer of some thick layers of sediments that formed um, uh, filling in a kettle hole uh, pond. So the idea is this then that you start with um, 
uh, an area of cleaner ice within within the glacier for some reason, for some random reason. Um, and then that gradually um, melts away, giving you a distinct depression, which is the Kettle Hall Pond, which then gets uh, filled in with um, with the peat um, and, and other sediments. And they can be up to 20 meters deep initially, and then they, they fill up. Um, and then most of them actually were pretty full up thousands of years ago, and but they've just continued to, um, uh, the organic matter in them decays a bit and leaves a little bit more space for sediment to accumulate. So um, a lot of the peat deposits we see inside them actually are not very recent. They're, they're, they're at least several thousand years old in most cases. Um, now, so we've had a go at coring um, at some of these sites and led by Warren Eastwood, who's, who's here in the middle there. Um, and, and looking for particularly for peat deposits because they are um, rich in pollen grains. And so here we see there's, a, there's a, some peat here, and then this is a pink clay deposit. So we, we found there's a, quite a lot of um, uh, clay and silt that, that's washed into a lot of these ponds, apparently in a kind of random fashion. Um, so to actually understand exactly what happened, it's actually quite a complicated uh, process because. Um, it's a, it's a huge amount of work to extract the pollen from a given layer. So it's normally something that you know is, is quite a um, can only be done as part of um, a distinct project, such as a, a student project. And then to really get you to know what's going on, you you could do with carbon dating it. Without carbon dating, there are comparisons that can be made with other cores in the region, but obviously carbon dating helps. So at the moment we have, there's one core that. Is worth going to be worth carbon dating that we took. Um, that's from the Midlands in, in Taunton Park, um, and I'm, I'm hoping to, we can get those samples sent off for dating soon. It, it has been studied by a student, and it includes some what we think is some um, deposits that are from the last few thousand years, which is which is unusual in this area. What's more typical is what we see here, where we see a record. Um, of what was called the late glacial period, here shown between 14,000 and 11,000, um, during the initial stages of the, the pond being open and, and accumulating sediment. So, so what is done is that on, uh, the, the pollen are extracted, um, and there is this very, very characteristic climate fluctuation that's found um, uh, between 12 and 13,000 years ago. This is this is called the Younger Dryas interval also coinciding with the last time there were glaciers in Britain, uh, what in Scotland's called the Loch Lomond Readvance. So there's some very young and very fresh hummocky moraines in, in Scotland, which I'm hoping to see in a field trip in, in September, um, that uh, correspond with this, with this cold interval when the, when the uh, a climate that had warmed up, uh, cooled again, and then finally warmed again. And this final warming at 11,600 years ago is the beginning of our current um, Holocene interglacial um, epoch. Um, so that, that so this blue interval here is the last time that things were particularly cold. So in Herefordshire, then the oldest um, sediment that's been dated is um, some, somewhere around the left-hand side of the um, of the diagram. So there's a couple that were called in the mid 90s, both of which are now, um, they've been damaged at the surface, so we, we, we couldn't go back and recall in those places. Um, unfortunately, Warren Eastwood is now retired, but um, you know, there, there is scope to do a lot more of this, of this kind of work, but it's just trying to find a, a suitable partner to do it with. Um, one or two examples then of, of, of ponds on the ground. This is at uh, Lupton, a lovely pond that's on a public right of way. So you can walk up and, and see it. And what's happened here is that in order to make a, a bit of space here, the, the farmer has, has dredged up some of the bottom sediment. And you can see it's got pebbles in it. It's actually a till, a glacial deposit. But there's also um, an accumulation of um, dark mud with some plant remains in it that, that's, that's in there as well. And so we would normally expect ponds to be underlain by something like till, which doesn't let water pass through it very easily. It's, a, it's impermeable. Um, because if there was sand and gravel underneath, you, you'd expect the, um, 
the water to disappear in, into the ground unless the water table was unusually high. So if we look at this diagram, it, it shows us this is a stream. You can see the water table underground, and so um, the water table position coincides with where the stream is. What you can have, though, um, in the case of a pond, is that you could have a situation where um, this pond is underlain by <coughs> uh, impermeable sediment, what's called an aquaclude in this diagram. Um, and it may be perched higher in the landscape than the, the regional water table. We don't know very much about that, and, and we haven't really been able to gather very much data so far in this project, but uh, um, this is potentially an area of, um, of great interest, really understanding how the water in the ponds relates. So we we will get some information on this um, during the summer. Um, we're looking at, uh, at getting some isotope data that will tell us about how much water has evaporated. Uh, to, uh, we can use that to think, get an idea about evaporation versus sinking into the ground of, of the water as uh, things progress during the year. So the fate of the water in ponds then is, is clearly of interest when it comes to um, managing the ponds. Um, here we are in Kenchester area, which I, I know many of you have, have been to this area. It's a kind of classic one for, um, for these ponds. And in this LIDAR image, I've, I've superimposed the geological map and the green is are the hummocky moraines. And in some of the pond depressions, the Geological Survey have mapped this yellow colour, which is which is peak deposits. Um, they haven't always mapped that. That's partly because it's difficult to to actually identify it um, consistently across the ground because it's very time consuming to auger into the ground and find what's underneath. But we see that adjacent to this this area, um, we've got more um, other deposits. This pink stuff are uh, deposits of streams that were draining the glacier and what we call, um, call glacier fluvial sands and outwash sands. And the yellow is formed by stream deposits that, that happened during uh, current interglacial, during the Holocene in the last 11,000 years. So there are several different things um, going on uh, in, in that area. Here we are in Kenchester on the ground. Um, you can see a little bit of the, the hummocky topography in, in the background here. Um, and this is the largest pond. And this particular pond is much bigger than it used to be. You can see that from the, the tree that's, um, that's growing uh, in, in, well, in an unfavorable position. It wouldn't be able to grow, uh, start growing now. Um, and there's also a variation in the, in the area of the pond, the depth of the water seasonally. There is a, a spring that's coming out at the, um, a little bit away from the pond that we see here. So clearly this is an area where there is active groundwater flow um, and there is a suspicion that the higher water levels at the present may be something to do with the changes in the drainage uh, resulting from the Yeza Brook flood alleviation scheme whereby um, water was diverted to uh, the River Wye. Um, now we're moving up to the north part of the area and we're seeing some more moraines. So these, this is uh, some rather larger scale um, hummocky moraines. Uh, and in this view, they look as though they're elongated, but on the LIDAR image, they, they don't look as though they're elongated. Uh, but I've also been supervising a Birmingham undergraduate student who's looking at trying to quantify the shape of the landscape using LIDAR. And she reckons that actually there are a lot of elongated features. In the landscape that are not so obvious uh, on, the, on the line of images. So um, what we've just been looking at is the area down here in the lower left around 31, uh, those rounded shapes of that landscape I was looking at. So they don't, in my mind, they don't look very elongated, but there are in the landscape some areas that, that are elongated. And I've learned from this supervising the student project how difficult it is to actually quantify the shape of the landscape. Um, it's a very complicated shape and, and really, really quite tricky to deal with. Now, one of the features that we can see uh, on here uh, very nicely are channels that have been cut by meltwater. So each of these um, deeply incised valleys here um, were formed by meltwater, probably meltwater streams that were forming underneath the ice. Um, 
And so they, these are really very striking. And on the um, one of the resources that we're producing in the project is a landscape tour where you can go by bike or car, and drive along this route. And one of the things, you know, one, you know, I got this amazing surprise when I first went along here and peered over the road and saw this whopping great big channel right next to the road where I wasn't expecting it. So that's really quite an interesting feature of this, uh, of this landscape here. Um, and then further um, to the northeast of the area, we're in the Lupton area. I showed you a pond from Lupton um, earlier on, that's just here. Um, but you can see there's some really quite large hills and they, they look as though they're streamlined and elongated. Um, what we don't know is, is how thick the glacial sediment is on them, or whether these are largely bedrock hills that have been eroded and then draped with glacial um, sediment. Um, a, a, an awful lot of work would need to be done to, to actually establish exactly what's going on uh, in, in this area. So bedrock is shown by this, um, this grey shade and the, the till, glacial deposits on bedrock are shown by this bluey grey colour and then uh, recent river alluvium in, in the other. Um, so something about how these, these erosional features form, um, on the left I'm standing on a glacier in Svalbard, uh, about to jump across this little stream here, and very mindful of the fact that it's underlain that this is smooth ice underneath the water. If I were to lose my footing and fall into this stream, I might get carried along and end up going down um, into a crevasse or um, a, a hole that will go down to the base of the glacier and that would be the end of me. So I had that in mind uh, when taking this uh, when taking this, this photograph, which actually it's still from a video. So they're quite, um, they're very powerful and they're quite dangerous on the surface of the ice. Then they go down to the bottom of the glacier. Here we are underneath the glacier. And you can see that by the time several of these streams have combined together, um, they are kept, they are very powerful and they can move things as big as these huge boulders um, and cause a lot of erosion. So that's what we're talking about when, when we're looking at those erosional features in the landscape. It's, it's big streams like this. So here the water level is very low, but clearly at time that water level is the water's filling the whole of this zone and moving enormous boulders. And it's possible that um, such Subglacial drainage may be responsible for um, chains of ponds that we see, uh, particularly in the southwest of the area. This is in Mocus Park area. These are, there's a whole series of depressions that are lined up. And in fact, it, it, it carries on also to the Blakemere area, which is just to the southeast. Um, because um, meltwater channels underneath the ice don't have to flow downhill, they're under pressure. And they so they can go up and down a little bit like a sort of roller coaster. And that's what's what's happening here. So uh, the base of the channel is going going up and then down again. So we think that may may be how these the, this chain of ponds is formed. Uh, another place where meltwater channels are seen is the Brainton area. Um, and um, on the resources that we're producing, there there are several walks. And this is a walk around the Brainton area, shown in red. And on the walk, you go by these two this couple of deep valleys here. Uh, which um, where the water would have flowed uphill uh, and then down again on the other side um, while ice was overhead. So before the ice age, the River Wye flowed from west to east up in the north part of this map. Um, then there was a lot of deposits forming in the area that was extracted in this big uh, disused quarry here, Stretton Suggers, um, which is now um, a, a nature reserve, the Brockhall Country Park Nature Reserve. Um, but after the Ice Age, um, the River Wye couldn't go through here anymore. And it cut a new course, which is down here, uh, just south of, of, of Brainton. So on the walk around, you actually see the place, the, the gorge that's been cut here is the River Wye. So it's actually pretty steep here. And you, I'm, I'm looking up from that riverbank. I'm seeing some chimney pots at the top there. Um, that, that's, a, that's a gorge that's been cut. And that gorge was cut down 30 metres, probably would you know, pretty quickly um, after the Ice Age. So there are several features like that in the, uh, in the landscape where rivers have changed course and, and, and cut down into the landscape. So this map shows us um, uh, resources that are going to be available, um, both in, um, a lot of them in, on an app. We're also producing a leaflet in the Earth Heritage Trust Explore series, 
um, which has three additional walks that aren't on the app. Um, so I've just been doing that recently. Um, so there are lots of different lots of different places here that are covered by walks. And then this is the, the landscape tour, which as I say is by car or bike, and it's divided into three sections. So to get overwhelmed in a given day. So um, the area we're looking at is huge. And even so, I've had two advanced queries uh, with questions uh, to be answered after this talk. And they, they both cover areas that are not, are not in the areas that are covered by this, because there's such a big area to cover. But anyway, we'll, we'll have a look at those in a minute. <clears throat> and finally, I'll just have another look at one of these lovely LIDAR maps with geology superposed. Superimposed. This is this is the no plain area. Um, and on the very first slide I showed you this morning, there was a there was a pond um, uh, that was sh that was shown looking from this road, and um, that's a pond that's only there in winter. It's just a marshland in in summer, and it represents uh, the end of this glacial channel, which has been filled by peat uh, in this in this landscape for Hummocking rain. Now I love this snow plain area. It's very, very quiet there. Lovely place to go for a for a walk or, for, or a cycle. Um, and it's you can see from this image just how much you can decipher just looking at the geology. So we've got an eroded bedrock at the top, but most of the area is draped with glacial sediment. But then after the ice age, other things have happened. Um, Pete has infilled some of these depressions that's shown in yellow. But also we can see how the River Arrow has cut down and the River Arrow has also changed its course. We're not really sure when that happened, but it could have been after the last um, ice age. Um, River Arrow used to run further south, down, down towards Pembridge. Um, but here is that it has actually made a gorge and it's actually cut down so that there is a bedrock, which is shown in pink here, um, which is um, on the on the side of the of the valley and in places on the valley uh, floor um, and then we've got slope deposits that have, that have come down some of these steep valleys and, and deposited sediment on top as well so there's an awful lot you can you can see by looking at these uh, uh, environments so that's all i have to say um, this morning as i say there are a couple of advanced questions that i can uh, uh, tell you about in, in reference to I, I can bring up the uh, the maps on, on, on the, uh, the geographic information system um, and, that, and, that, and those questions relate to one or two other areas that I haven't mentioned so far. Thank you very much Ian, that's excellent. Yeah. Very um, very useful um, re revealing talk and explains, I, I constantly have to be reminded of what we're talking about on this this side of things but I'm sure there's lots lots of geologists um, listening. Any, are there any questions for Ian on the talk? So you can one. type them in the chat box yeah, if you want to. There's one coming here um, from Selena. Going back to, oh, hold on, I just missed it, lost it. Going back to O-level geography, what's the difference between a drumlin and a hummocking moraine? Um, Yes, a, a drumlin is um, a landform which is streamlined um, and drumlins do not occur on their own. They're like mammoths, Beth. They occur in, in swarms. <laughs> um, and uh, the most famous examples we see in Britain are in places like the Solway Firth where they, they occur, occur in these swarms. Um, they're relatively large landforms. They're streamlined. They form mainly by erosion. And they represent uh, what happens in, in an area where the ice is moving much more quickly than normal. Um, and in the case of the Solway Firth, in fact, it's ice in the Irish Sea that's that's breaking off and carving, and and the glacier behind is accelerating its flow. But these are things that we call ice streams, and there are quite a few of them in Antarctica. Um, you wouldn't expect to see drumlins in an area like this uh, in Herefordshire because um, you, you don't have a mechanism by which ice should, should suddenly start flowing really quickly because the, the glacier is ending on land rather than in the sea. But nevertheless, there is some evidence of streamlining that we can see in places and I, I don't really understand why that should be. And I'm hoping that my Keel colleague, Richard Waller, will be able to, to help uh, with that, uh, understanding that. 
Hummocky moraines then are, are much smaller scale features that um, are polygenetic. In other words, that they that there are they must form in several different ways. Um, and we know that those that form by pushing, by thrusting, are one distinctive type. Others just form by passive melting. Um, and there are others that are more complicated because they are um, affected by meltwater, the redistributing sediment and changing the shape of the land uh, afterwards. Those are things that are, are called canes. Um, that, uh, you know, again, it's like a dustbin term to cover lots of different sorts of features. So, um, so that's, you know, that's what, the, that's what the, the, the textbooks would tell us, but applying the textbook knowledge to Herefordshire is quite tricky. Mm -hmm. Is that, would I, would I have seen drumlins in, in Ireland, Central Ireland? Uh, you could, yes, you could have done. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think, think where they would, where they would be. When they're in, they're on the, um, on the eastern coast of Ireland, and, I, and I've seen a cross section through a drumlin in, in Northern Ireland on the, on the east, uh, on the yeah. margin of the Irish Sea. Um, yeah, I seem to remember the very, very regular hunt. Yeah. Yeah. landscape yeah my like one great yeah, place to see them actually is if you if you go up to Penrith and um and, and go west towards Keswick um there's quite a big landscape there that you you go over it's like a roller coaster landscape there and that and that's um yeah that's, that's a drum in okay um I, I could um if there are no questions at the moment there are a couple of questions that came in earlier um that I could I could uh, address um, and, and one of them, um, so I mentioned they were in places that I haven't uh, covered so far. Um, one of them's from the southwest of the area, one from the northeast. So if I go to the southwest, and we're going to go near Hay on Y, that's down here. So it's well west of them, our main area of interest. But there's a pond there that Will Watson very interested in. He's going to do a detailed survey uh, of it. It's called um, Leach. Pool, and I'm going to home in on it now. Yeah, it's up here. Yeah, leech pool. Here it is. Um, and so the question is from uh, from Dave Patterson, who's going to help um, with that uh, ecological survey, and he's wanting to know about this site um, because um, uh, Beth and I hadn't, uh, you know, we're a bit sniffy about it because we said, well. We really not sniffy, but we'll we just say got no. A lot it's a really good Yeah, it we, didn't we have our criteria. Is it? So, uh, well, I mean, so our immediate response is, well, it's a long way from all the other ponds. But anyway, it's um, uh, it's quite a large pond, as we can see. Um, you know, we've got a bit of concern about whether it, it might have been affected by anthropogenic activity, but. Actually, that probably applies to the vast majority of ponds we've got. They've been altered in ways that is actually really difficult to discern now by agricultural activities over the centuries. But in this case, there are actually two railways here. Yeah, there's a disused one and another railway that were quite close. Um, then we've got the castle up here. So, you know, maybe the castle would have used this as a water supply, who knows? Um, and then from the geology point of view, we've got the, the River Wye here, and the yellow is the modern day floodplain deposit, the alluvium. The orange color is um, a river terrace that would have formed um, sometime between 20,000 years ago and 10,000 years ago on, on the flanks of it. Then we've got Hamaki Moraine here, and then we've got a flatter till uh, glacial deposit landscape there. And the pond's kind of sitting near the boundary of all these, of all these different things going on. Um, so uh, you know it may it may you know it may well be a, a, a long lived pond, um, but there are plenty of opportunities for its for its deposits to have been um, disturbed um, uh, 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 over the centuries. I've got one or two um, other images I can I can bring up, um, and just illustrates the kinds of things that we've been doing during the project in in evaluating ponds. We've been looking at um, uh, historic maps, for example, this is the 19th century, the first series, one to 2,500 map, and we can see that um, you know the pond was pretty much its present size in the in the late 19th century. But what is just shown as a field boundary on later maps, there it looks as though it might be a drainage channel out out of the pond. It's a little bit difficult to 
be sure about that. We'll have to kind of go on ground, I think, and look at that. Um, on the on the new series map, it looks pretty bland, like that. On the air photos, um, then we see. You know, we can see why the ecologists are interested in this. You know, it's got a, it's, it's, you know, it's got a lot of different uh, ecological zones here. There are quite a lot of trees, but it's not all uh, shaded by trees. And there, and there's this island where um, you know, certain uh, organisms could, could could live safe from predation, maybe in the middle of the of the pond. And then we've got the lidar images as well, um, which are, yeah, they're they're, they're fairly. Fairly bland images, but we can see that the sort of hummocky nature of the landscape in the, in the field uh, around there. So that's um, yeah. So that's so I've not been to visit this pond, but that's that's its setting, and, and it is going to be surveyed uh, shortly. Um, yeah, one of the reasons we said um, we put some project time into it was because the the farmer was very keen she's going into stewardship or they're going into a stewardship scheme and um, yes. we're interested in getting some information they contacted will right as well very keen yeah so in a way yeah. in terms of the conservation of of yeah. habitat yeah. and ponds for the project it fits in and i'm aware that it doesn't yeah. quite meet the criteria of of the rest of the project well i mean, I mean it, it doesn't not meet the geological criteria um and and i think you know that this that this landowner interest and so on that's a really important reason mm. for studying it um then if we go to the, the other end there's a there's a quick uh, there's just a um a suggestion that's come in this morning from nick house who i think is on the line uh, this morning um about um the coven hope valley which is up here in the northeast it's near mortimer cross um, up here, just zoom in a bit on that. Can I just, while you're doing that, Selena's just um, dropped in a question about the size range of Ice Age ponds, typical diameters, if there is such a thing. <laughs> it's quite variable, isn't it? Depending yes. on, on how they're yeah. treated. The, 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 yeah, the, 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 modern, the modern examples I showed you, um, were quite small, but of course those, you know, there's still a lot of evolution of those to go. Um, so I think it, it, yes, I mean, typically, I mean, it could be anything from you know, 10 meters across to a couple of hundred meters. Um, I, I think the, the trouble is that our understanding is also colored by what we see in the landscape now. And, and as I say, there's, there's a lot of potential for uh, enlargement of ponds, by farmers or alternatively filling in a pond and their area becoming more restricted. Um, actually thinking about that, there's there's a good example of that um, in Staunton on Y, um, place I've visited recently, which I think Will, is in, Will and Giles are interested in looking at. So if we, if we go to Staunton on Y, I'm thinking of it, here we are, there's, um, so this is this is the Staunton moraine that's shown here in, in green, and it's enclosing this Letton Lowlands area. You can see it's very marshy looking over there. Um, and there's this big um, area of peat shown here near Duck Street, just north of Staunton on Wye. Um, but the pond now is much smaller than that. Um, in fact, in the late 19th century, it was only the very eastern part of it that, that existed. Um, but clearly, in the past, it, it's quite a big area that that um, has been filled with um, uh, sediment uh, as a depression. So, you know, that, you know that, that's that's pretty big, really. That's a couple hundred meters across. Um, right. Let's just go now to Coven Hope in the northeast. As Ian said, the in winter, tens of meters and a 10, 20 metres tend to be about the smallest ones we've seen, up to a few hundred metres, maybe two, 250 maximum, for certainly from the ones we've visited so far. Um, and they tend to err on the slightly smaller side, kind of 50-ish tends to be. There are the occasional big ones, but most of the ones we've visited so far, Selena, have been quite a bit smaller than that. 